I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm not a technological genius. Um, I'm not e really even that smart. I, uh, I'm a 60-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer. I'm hopping mad about the state of cancer research and the fact that 1,500 Americans die every single day from cancer. That means 1,500 Americans are going to die today and yesterday and tomorrow. One in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. We are not doing a very good job. So I'm a patient, but I'm, and I've been a cancer patient for six years, but I'm an extremely impatient one. Um, Now, even though I think about cancer probably 24-7, Deepak, I try to meditate and put it out of my mind. Um, but that's, I don't want my cancer to define me, so I'm many other things. I'm a mother and I'm a wife, and I'm a motion picture producer. That's how I spend most of my time. So I come from this kind of surreal land of make-believe where all the unsolvable problems are, are solved within the space of about two hours and 20 minutes. So imagine this picture. Um, we're in an operating room, and there's a very, Keith Black is probably operating, and it's a very intense brain surgery. And there are two lead surgeons, and they've opened up the patient, and they're about to go in for this glioblastoma, and it's so tense, the nurses are mopping their brows, and they've even turned off the music. And the two doctors look at each other, and they're just about to go for that tumor. And one doctor turns to the other and said, look at it this way, George. It's not like we're making a movie. <laughs> so I'm going to talk for a minute <laughs> about how making a movie is like curing cancer. Um, most movie projects in Hollywood begin over a meal. And about two years ago, Katie Couric and Lisa Paulson, who runs the Entertainment Industry Foundation, were having breakfast with Jeff Zucker, who runs NBC. And Jeff Zucker, as many of you know, is a two-time cancer survivor. And they posed the idea of doing a television show to raise awareness and to raise money um, about cancer. And he was kind of interested, but he didn't commit. About two months later, I was having lunch with Sherry Lansing, who used to run Paramount Pictures and is now a leading philanthropist. She had joined forces with Lisa and Katie, and she said to me, we're talking about doing this TV show. And I said, well, that's really interesting, because another group of women approached me about doing a cable show to raise money for cancer. But I wanted to make a documentary, because I had recently produced the 2007 Academy Awards, and that was the year of an inconvenient truth. And I watched the power of the mediums in which I work to tip the conversation, if you believe in tipping points, and I do. Not that many people saw that movie, but my own sort of um, Vox Populi, I went into Barney's department store um, after an inconvenient truth came out, it was Christmas time, and I got a shopping bag, and the shopping bag said, have a green Christmas. And a year ago, green would have meant something completely different, but we all knew what it meant that year because of an inconvenient truth. So I wanted to make some propaganda about cancer and the state of cancer research. So we all had, there were three diverse groups, three groups that just happened to be women. You can put up the slide. There we are, and Katie Couric, who's not in that slide. Um, we had to come together, and that's one of the basic tenets of Stand Up to Cancer, and it's one of the basic things you have to do when you make a movie, which is you have to bring people together, and they have to work together. Not so easy. We all had our own ideas. We all wanted to do our own thing, but for the greater good, we had to come together. So we were the first, what I'll call, Stand Up to Cancer dream team. And when we all came together, Lo and behold, three other vicious competitors, NBC, ABC, and CBS, not Fox, they demurred, we don't know why, um, agreed to come together, set aside their competitiveness, competitiveness, 
and give us a full hour of commercial-free television to make a show about cancer. So that was, was super exciting. So the second thing you have to do when you're making a movie is you have to know who your audience is. So I need your participation in this. If you have been touched by cancer personally, either had cancer, had a close family member or a close friend with cancer, would you raise your hand? Okay, now you may not want to do this, but I need you to do it because we've all been sitting on our butts too long. If you raised your hand, would you stand up? Now, you're all standing up to cancer. You can sit down now. <laughs> That's what we want everyone in this country to do who's been touched by cancer. So we wanted to create what I call a populist movement. We would be called ACT UP, but it was taken. So, because we looked at what people with HIV AIDS did and how they impacted the way their disease was treated. Only patients can do that. We are the ones who have to do it. We have to demand it. So you're the audience for this little movie that we're talking about. The next thing we did was we said, OK, we're going to do this TV show. We have the potential maybe to raise a lot of money. And then we said, well, that's what the world needs, another cancer organization asking for money. So I give money all the time, American Cancer Society. I do the run walks. I don't know if you know, I have no idea where that money goes. No one ever writes me a letter and says, we got your check, and here's what happened, and here's how we're curing cancer or making cancer a manageable disease. So we kind of said, we were going to go out into the entertainment community, use our currency and our relationships, put on a show for the American public, ask them for money. We better have a good idea of what we're going to do with the money. And we wondered why so much money was being spent and why my prognosis, metastatic breast cancer, is no better today with my diagnosis, and David Agus said this the other day, my prognosis is no better today than it was, would have been 40 years ago. This is unforgivable. So um, we looked at what was wrong. And interestingly, there was tremendous consensus and it all goes back to this idea of collaboration, like these nine women who had to come together and work together. We discovered what a lot of you know, that the scientific culture is really supports you all being in silos, not talking to each other, not communicating, not sharing. It supports competition. We also know the extraordinary things that we've done in this country going to the moon or creating the atom bomb came because someone set a goal, said, we're going to go to the moon. We don't know how to get there, but we're going to go there. We're going to work together, and that's how we're going to get there. With the Manhattan Project, we were under attack. We thought we're all going to die if we don't create an atom bomb before the Germans do. So scientists who didn't really like each other and weren't that used to working together were locked up in Los Alamos, and they solved the problem. Well, we are no less under siege, under attack from cancer than we were from that bomb. So we said we would focus on one narrow aspect of cancer. And those of you who know anything about cancer, it's an extraordinarily complex problem. I like to say it's like education. It's so multifaceted. So when you look at the problem and you think there's issues of access, there's issues of treatment. There's issues of how do you, of integrative medicine versus allopathic. There's issues of money. Where do we focus? And there are lots of cancer organizations. And not surprisingly, it's not just the scientists who don't work together, but the cancer advocacy community is extraordinarily divisive. Someone called it the balkanization of the body parts. So, the breast cancer people fight the prostate cancer people. They're fighting for limited resources. So we said, let's create a big tent. We know that cancer in the future, again, as David discussed, won't be characterized by body part. It'll be characterized by tumor type. And that's what we really have to work on and, and exploit in creating treatments. Let's focus on making scientists work together 
collaboration in order to accelerate treatments. So we partnered with the American Association of Cancer Research. We needed an umbrella organization. And we told them what we wanted to do. We said, we want to put together dream teams of scientists across institutions and across disciplines to be focused on very specific, sort of low-hanging fruit. So as you know, we know a lot about cancer. When war was declared on cancer by Richard Nixon almost 50 years ago, we didn't know a lot, but we had resources. Now we know a lot. In that 50 years, it's not like nothing's happened. A tremendous amount of information has been accumulated. But as a patient, I say, OK, enough with the looking at the cells under the microscope. What are you going to do for me? How are you going to take what you know and translate it into new therapies, more effective therapies? We know that if you're diagnosed early, you have a chance of curing your cancer. But we also know those 1,500 people who are going to die today, they obviously didn't get diagnosed early. So we need better treatments. So we put together this Blue Ribbon Committee headed by Philip Sharp and someone mentioned Elizabeth Blackburn, who just won the Nobel Prize, and Brian Drucker, who is the pioneer of Gleevec, which is a targeted pill that treats CML, and that's what we want for all cancers. We put together this committee. We put out a call for proposals. We got 247 proposals. I forgot the most important part. On September 8th, we put on a show. We enlisted the entire entertainment um, community. Over 100 celebrities came out and participated because they, like all of you, were touched by this disease. And I called everyone I know, and David Fincher made that PSA, and Errol Morris did work for us, and everybody came, and um, even Homer Simpson. I'll show you. You can roll that. Homer, I've gotten you the most important gift a man your age can get. You're having your boobs embiggened? You don't have to. They're fine just the way they'll be. No, you're getting a colonoscopy. Oh, that's wonderful. Pardon me for a moment. Colonoscopy is an endoscopic examination of the large... Oh, I don't understand. They stick a camera up your uh-oh, but this time you won't be doing it to win a bar bet. That bar bet paid for the camera removal. Welcome to the Mayo Clinic. Mmm, Mayo. I'm glad you're here, Homer. Early detection can lead to complete removal of tumorous polyps and... Are we going to talk or make a movie? Now, Homer, breathe into this mask. He's asleep. I almost feel guilty about charging for the anesthesia. <laughs> almost. Will he be all right, doctor? Listen, don't worry. I've done hundreds of these, and good lord. This ass is why I became a doctor. This is my Sistine Chapel. This is my Moby Dick. This is my Sergeant Peppers. How did that get in there? There's his wedding band. He told me he was getting it polished. According to this, he has three active polyps. Now comes the fun part. You cut them out? Oh, we don't use that term. We prefer rip. I feel great. Once there was a mountain, now there's a breeze. Hallelujah. Let's take this new colon out for a spin to Krusty Burger. Oh, well, uh, Mr. Simpson, the camera's still inside you. I'll return it after Lisa's recital. Hallelujah. Not a dramatization. This is footage of an actual colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was courtesy of Jim Brooks. That was my attempt to make cancer entertaining, and it worked. We raised over $100 million from the public and from private donors. We have tremendous partners in Major League Baseball and Michael Bloomberg and AARP and, and many, many more. So um, less than nine months after the show, we announced, we took the 247 proposals. We did something extraordinary with our funding model. We asked our scientific advisors to interact with the dream teams who gave the proposals. This rarely happens. So they had direct communication, and five grants were given. Um, you can go on standuptocancer.org and see the grants are given, as I said, across institution and across disciplines and they cover breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, probably a dozen different cancers. 
Their, their mandate is to have a therapy and clinical trials within three years. They also have to meet milestones every, and report to us every six months. If they're not on track, they have to tell us how they're going to get on track or the money goes away. For those of you who apply for grants, you know this is unheard of. Um, and then we're about to announce in November um, 13 innovative grants, which are, are lesser amounts to um, young researchers for innovative out-of-the-box um, science. So our expectation is that there will be, if, if it's a great grand experiment, you know, we don't know who will deliver, and I love Kerry Mullis saying that he thinks of, of the research he does as engineering. This is very specifically goal-oriented research. We don't, we like basic research, we support basic research, but this is bench to bedside. We will get drugs that will impact patients within three years. So that's the goal of Stand Up to Cancer, and we hope you'll all support us. I'm going to close by saying um, every movie needs a score, right? You've got to have music in your movie. And um, I was fortunate enough fortunate enough to meet the extraordinary Dave Stewart, and he wrote a song for us, and he and Anne-Marie Calhoun and Cindy Gomez are going to sing it for you, and hopefully you'll sing along. Come on. Thank you. It's almost a year since we sat next to Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I'm going to shoot you with my... Stand up to cancer flip cam. Yeah, yeah it's an absolute <laughs> honor to work with Laura and uh, be able to do anything possible to help. Music is um, something that often can transcend um, you know, words. And, and I think when you hear this song, we've recorded it in many ways. The other night we recorded it with Hans Zimmer and a full orchestra. Lots of people will be recording it in their own languages around the world. and. Uh, and it goes something like this. Play the tape. Yes.